Today is the fifth Sunday of Easter. My name is Steve Delano. I'm the pastor at the Mayville and Campbellsport United Methodist Churches, and we welcome you to our online worship. Please join me in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we are grateful that you have called us together this day, drawing us from darkness to the glory of your light. May our spirits rejoice at the good news you have for us today. Open our hearts to your healing love, for we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Our opening hymn is For the Beauty of the Earth, written by Folliot S. Pierpoint. Let us sing together. Our New Testament lesson today is from the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verses 31 through 35. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little, little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. 
you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The setting for this passage is important for us to recall. This is part of Jesus's farewell discourse to his disciples. It takes place during the Last Supper. The first verse of the passage begins with the words, when he has gone out. The person that the gospel writer John is referring to is Judas Iscariot. Judas has left the upper room after Jesus told him to go and do quickly what he was going to do. So Judas left. This is a dark moment. Not only does John tell us that it is nighttime in the preceding verse, it is truly dark as Jesus has told the disciples that one of them would betray him. And now Judas has left to go to do this, to go betray Jesus. After Judas leaves, what does Jesus do next? Does he take this opportunity to tell the others that Judas is the betrayer? Does he disparage Judas at all? No, of course not. Jesus focuses on his mission and preparing the disciples for what is to come. He speaks of being glorified and of glorifying God. This glorification will be realized in his death on the cross and his resurrection. Through, through these events, God will be glorified in Christ. Yes, through these events, God will be glorified in Christ. What does it mean in verse 31 that Jesus says, the Son of Man has been glorified and God has been glorified in him? The meaning of glory is very great praise, honor, or distinction bestowed by common consent or renown. However, Jesus is speaking of the divine glory or the brightness and resplendence of divine truth that comes from divine love that is now in him, just as he has shown the glory and resplendence of the Father by doing God's work here on earth. The process of glorification is a process of Jesus' humanity, fully divine and fully one with the Father, which is the divine soul. When Jesus ascends to the Father, he will complete the process of glorification. Jesus will gain all power, which is divine power. As he says in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, all power is is given unto me in heaven and earth. With that power, he de defeated and continues to defeat the power of evil and hell for all people who are willing to accept that divine power into their lives. Then he tells his disciples in gentle and tender words, calling them little children, that he will be with them only a little longer, and that where he is going, they cannot come. Next, Jesus points to the need for his disciples to live in community, to love one another as he has loved them. For Jesus, love did not mean a sweet, sentimental feeling. It, it meant action. It meant actively loving, putting one's love into real-world activities. This new commandment comes with a sense of both tenderness and mercy. Digging deeper into the meaning of loving one another, on the one hand, loving one another as Jesus loves encompasses the mundane, normal, day-to-day -day activities. It means serving one another even in the most menial tasks as Jesus has done with his disciples. 
He served them by washing their feet. He showed them that their master, their teacher, was not above serving them in a caring and subservient manner. On the other hand, this love encompasses heroic acts of great risk. It extends even to the point of giving one's life for another. Jesus will soon live out this example for the disciples, for all of us, through suffering and death on the cross. Jesus could not be clearer. It is not by our theological correctness, not by our moral purity, not by our impressive knowledge that everyone will know that we are disciples. No, it is quite simply by our loving acts, acts of service and sacrifice, acts that point to the love of God for the world made known in Jesus Christ. We should also be cognizant of who we love. It is relatively easy to demonstrate love for family and friends. It is easy to show love for those that agree with us, those that we share similarities or common beliefs. Do we draw lines on who we love? Are we tempted to be less loving to some? I believe that we must guard against this, both as individuals and as a church. We must guard against selectively loving those that are like us. Remember when Jesus shared his mission statement with us in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, he, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus' love was an active love. Jesus' love was about justice for all. Justice that he demonstrated through not only his words, but more significantly by his actions. Friends, we would do well to listen to this commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you should also love one another. We are called to love others as a mark of our own discipleship so that others will know us as Christians by our love. Amen. Please join me in an attitude of prayer. When the news is loudly proclaiming anger, hostility, hatred, and we are called by Christ to love one another. How hard that is, O oh Lord. Prejudice abounds in our land, and it is our shame as we proclaim our faith in you. You call us to love one another but we put conditions on that love. Some of these conditions regard race, economic status, gender, age, nationality. It is easy to love people with whom we are comfortable. It is more difficult to love those who are different from us. And that, O oh Lord, is our dilemma. Teach us how to love and accept the diversity in our land. Help us to treasure each other for the wondrous gifts and talents each person has. Sharpen our ears to hear words of love when whispered and shouted. Tune our hearts to your healing message of acceptance and compassion for all. Help us to be the people of the resurrection who have been freed from the bonds of death we place our lives in your care, merciful Lord. Amen.
Thank you for worshiping with us. Receive the benediction. May the love of God, which was lavished upon you by Jesus Christ, be in your hearts, your minds, and your spirits as you go forth into God's world. Be bearers of peace and hope to all you meet. And may God's peace be with you always. Amen. Thank you.